Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga episode. My name is Adam. It is Misham Repember the 23rd. This is going to be a fun little episode. Now, today we're reviewing Lord Soth by uh, Ido Van Belkum. I think I'm saying that right. I hope I'm saying it right. Sorry if I didn't, man. Um, this is a spoiler review, though. So if you... First of all, if you're watching this and you don't know Lord Soth's history... Do you even like Dragonlance? I kind of feel like it's this pervasive story that is ever present in everything Dragonlance, full stop. But on the off chance that you don't know the minutia of his fall from grace that I'm going to be writing some light on, don't tune in anymore. Turn this off, go read the book yourself, because it is genuinely a good book. But we're going to get into all that. I'd like to take a moment and thank the Heroes of the Lands, my collaborator patrons, and invite you to consider becoming a patron or member of this channel by visiting the links in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance Gaming Materials and all those links are in the description. Now, this is my perspective only, so if you disagree, that's okay. Just let me know. Put it in the YouTube chat if you're watching live or if you're watching after the fact. Put it in the comments. Either way, we're going to have a good time because we're going to be talking about Dragonlance and my personal favorite character or villain, Lord Soth. Now, the way these reviews work is that I'm just going to read my pre-written review and then I'm just going to sort of riff. I'm going to talk about uh, whatever pops into my head based off of what I was talking, uh, you know, what I reviewed. But then if you have any comments, uh, I'll address those as well after I'm finished reading. This was not a very long book, so I don't expect a very long review. As you can see, I got a couple of Dragonlance uh, images happening behind me I'm pretty excited about, which prompted me to do the video version of this. And another thing I want to hear from you is, um, if you're okay with it, let me know. Would you prefer not seeing my face <laughs> and just the artwork? Because I definitely respect that. But on the off chance you feel a little bit of human connection and you're more likely to engage, well, then I definitely appreciate that. So just let me know what you think, and I will definitely take it into consideration for future episodes of these live shows that I put together. So here we go. I grew up loving fantasy films, films with knights and maidens, and magic captured my attention, and none were greater in my opinion than the film Excalibur. It featured the story of King Arthur and the Holy Grail. It was resplendent with chivalry and battle, all the while showcasing the knights' humanity as they struggled to live up to their lofty ideals through their human desires. I see a lot of that in this novel. Book One, Sun's Rise, is all about how Lord Lauren Soth ordered his faithful knight, Caradoc, to murder his father's illegitimate children to ensure his uncontested rise to take over his father's lands. It focuses on his hatred for his father, for having put him in his place and or I'm sorry, in this place, and for his father's lack of willpower for women that put him in the place to begin with. Now, a wonderful foreshadow for the reader here. It then shared how Lord Soth was presented to the Knights Council for consideration into the Knights of the Rose. This reminds me of my time in the military when I had to appear before my leaders for review before I was granted my stripes as a non-commissioned officer. Lord Soth's deeds through fantasy obviously outshone my own, <laughs> He was immediately indu inducted into the uh, Rose Knighthood, and it describes the construction of Dergard Keep briefly. We're then immediately presented with the life and love of Lord Soth as he marries and expands his lands with Lady Corrine Gladria. Now, they struggle with being able to get pregnant, and as Lord Soth is called to defend a town that was assaulted by ogres. We are then shown his and his knight's tactics and prowess in battle, and how each knight rationalizes or outright ignores the oath and the measure, his knight Caradoc being the most flagrant. This again foreshadows their willingness to follow Lord Soth regardless of the code. Then they travel to Palanthus to attend a council and come across a group of elf maidens en route to Paladine's temple to become clerics who were assaulted by ogres. They searched and killed each and every ogre, again with varying adherence to their code, and Lord Soth finds Isolde Denisa. He immediately is attracted to her, and she to him. We get to see Soth struggle with his attraction and his devotion to his wife, and even question whether he loves Corinne after they haven't been able to secure an heir. Isolde kisses Soth as he's taking her to Dergard Keep alone, an unnecessary move, but Soth is compelled. 
not the kiss, the taking her to, <laughs> to his keep. Lord Soth has dreams throughout this book about his son dying in fire at varying ages and his inability to save him. Again, foreshadowing. Now, what I find interesting about this book is the setup of the king priest emboldening his wizards to read the thoughts of citizens and sentencing them to death if they think an evil thought through the edict of thought control. We're given a couple examples, and it's clear that the king priest is the true evil in the land. Now, this ends book one, and book two, Night's Fall, is all about, you guessed it, <laughs> Lord Lauren Soth, Knight of the Rose, falling from grace in the eyes of ni the knighthood and the world at large. Corinne and Soth are unable still to conceive, and Soth is seen being kissed by Isolde by the maid, who goes and then rats him out to Corinne, his wife. Now, Corinne and the maid both travel to a hedge witch, as Corinne believes that if she can give Soth an heir, he's going to forget all about that elf maiden and that kiss. Now, the hedge witch is reluctant to help, but they make a bargain. She will cast the dark magic necessary, but makes no promises as to the health of the child, as it will entirely depend on her husband's honor. Corinne, regardless of that kiss, is convinced and confident in Soth and accepts the bargain. She does, in fact, get pregnant, and things, things seem to get well for a while until she gives birth. Now, the healer that delivers the child, and the child looks, um, I'm sorry, the hero, <laughs> the healer delivers the child, and the child looks more like a creature, and then the healer calls for Lord Soth, who is convinced of Corinne's infidelity, as she would have had such an abomination. Ironically, at the moment of childbirth, it's Caradoc who actually knocks on uh, Isolde's door as Isolde and Lord Soth just finished having a boot scene of their own. You'll understand that reference if you watched any of these in the past. Um, let's see. So Corinne tells Soth about the witch and claims that Soth is in fact the corrupt one, not herself. Soth orders the healer out and, in a rage, savagely murders Corinne and their son. He burns their corpses, claiming that they died in childbirth, uh, childbirth and had a disease, hence the quick necessity to burn the corpses. Now, six months later, Soth actually marries Isolde, who's already pregnant. Uh, Soth's son with Isolde Denisa is born and named Peridor, in honor of Lord Soth's great-great-grandfather, who was the first of his line to become a Knight of Salamnia under Vinus Salumnus himself. Now, the maid is sharing the truth all over the keep about Lord Soth's infidelities, about the potential murder of his first wife and child. You can clearly understand that this isn't going well for the keep's morale. Um, the maid... Uh, is then eventually fired by Isolde. The maid travels then to Palanthus to speak to the Knight's Council and uh, and then to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally losing my place here. And they end up uh, beginning an investigation into her claims. They clearly don't believe what she has to say, but they have to check it out because it is a horrendous claim against a Knight of the Rose. So they call Lord Soth and his knights to Palanthus after their investigation when he's separated from his knights and immediately put on trial. They use the king priest's mage to get the truth out of their loyal healer and sentence Soth to death the following morning. Soth's knights decide to break him out. They rescue Soth, charge out of Palanthus, and flee up into the mountains pursued by the knights of Salamnia. They end up narrowly reaching Derigard Keep before they're caught uh, before they are caught, and the knights strip Soth of his knighthood and tell him if he leaves his lands that he will be executed on the spot. So, Soth and his knights made it back to the keep. They actually left one of the knights back after Soth's horse died of exhaustion, and uh, his knight gave the horse up. And then his knight was, like, standing there ready to face off against, like, a dozen or so knights that were charging after them, and they just went around him. Very, uh, I don't know. Not very exciting, anticlimactic to say the least for that night. But ultimately when they did get to the keep and the, the drawbridge is raising up and they're just like, well, what the hell do we do now? And the knight's just like, well, look, we had orders just in case this happened. We're just going to tell him that he, he lost his knighthood and he's stripped from it. And if we ever see him again, he's going to die. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. Um, 
let's see. Uh, sorry, I, I keep ranting and I lose my spot. So they tell him if he leaves the spot, uh, he's going to be executed. Now, this entire book is absolutely fantastic. I am obsessed with it. I don't want it to end. This is the end of the second book of this novel. We only have one left, and it's the shortest of all of them. And so I'm getting to a point reading this really kind of depressed because I am having a hell of a good time reading this novel, and I know it's ending. I already know what's going to happen. It's not like it's going to be a surprise end or a twist or anything. But this is a really well-written novel by an author who I think up till this point has only written one other novel. So, I mean, just strap in because it gets really, really good here. I'm a little bit bugged that he's still considered an eye of the rose to himself and his knights and his keep after the knights literally stripped him of his knighthood. And then in death, to sort of jump way ahead into the future... You know, he's still wearing the Salamnic armor, and it's always referenced that he's wearing this ancient ceremonial Salamnic armor whenever anyone comes across him. It just it just seems a little bit weird because he didn't die as a knight of Salamnia. He died as an outcast. So, I don't know. We're going to get into that. So, book three, Dead of Night. Eh? Get it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. It presents Lord Soth as a shell of himself. His wife refuses to accept that he committed the atrocities that he's con condemned for and prays to Mishakal for redemption. Soth joins her in the chapel eventually and prays to Paladine. Isolde wakes Soth from another one of his foreshadowing nightmares and tells him that she's received a message about his redemption. Isolde then, possessed by the gods, tells Lord Soth that he must travel to Istar and confront the king priest, who will strike Soth dead with lightning. The gods will then revive, resurrect Soth, and, the, and he will continue trying to stop the king priest, i.e. murder him. Now, each time the king priest strikes Soth down, the gods of Kryn will then resurrect him stronger than he was before, up until he is able to actually defeat the king priest. And that will ultimately end in his death as well. So Soth is facing this eventuality that I can go redeem my name, I can redeem my family, I, I can uh, save Kryn because they straight up tell him, look, you'll avert a cataclysm if you do this, which is, you know, part of the redemption arc here. You're not just going to kill the king priest, you're actually going to save the planet from his evil influence that he is too blind to see himself. And so Soth is really struggling with himself. He's like, I I don't want to die, but I certainly would like to have my son be able to join the knighthood and, and have a good future. And, you know, all of my knights, he has his 13 close knights with him at all times in his keep, they'll be redeemed as well. And so all in all, it'll be a total benefit. Isolde is encouraging him to go do it, but ultimately, again, it means his death. And so this is sort of a weight hanging around him. Um, ultimately, he goes to... Uh, he admits that he needs to do it for his son and to save Kryn, so he takes the three of his best 13 knights with him and leaves to um, Istar. Paladine clears their path of danger and provides actually food during their journey. After many days, they eventually come upon three elf maidens. Now, they taunt Soth about his past and his new wife's lack of fidelity, preying on every buried insecurity of Soth's. His knights are telling the whole time to ignore the elves as they must be sent by the king priest who is aware of Soth's quest and trying to deter him from continuing on the quest. But Soth is just unable to put what they're saying out of his mind and he becomes more and more enraged. Um, he ends up getting off of his horse. He strikes them down and just mutilates their corpses brutally, much like he did his wife and his first wife and his son. Uh, the abomination. When he's done, the elves actually disappear, thereby confirming that it was just a vision, probably prompted by the king priest in order to stop Soth. But Soth is too blinded by rage, jealousy, despair, and fear in order to hear the rational conclusion of his knights and the truth right before his eyes. So he mounts up on his horse. Uh, he immediately turns back to Derogard Keep in order to confront his supposedly... <laughs> The irony here is just so thick. He's going to confront his supposedly um, unfaithful wife, whom he had an unfaithful affair with on his first wife. Okay. 
Anyway, his knights try to catch up, but are completely incapable, as Soth is driven by otherworld madness and rage. He arrives at the keep and confronts Isolde, just as the fiery mountain passes overhead and ultimately crashes into Istar, shaking the entirety of the planet. Dergard Keep begins to get torn apart, and fires begin where no fires should exist, like stone. It engulfs the keep. A chandelier falls from the ceiling, pinning Isolde to the ground with her son, and the flames burn them alive, as Soth is reminded of the saying he heard at the very beginning of the book, and he thought about his own father. Our children shall bleed for our sins. He is convinced that if he saves his son's life, his son will end up wickeder than he is. Because he believes, because the sons need to pay for their father's sins, because his father had affairs and had two bastard children, that he opened the novel uh, asking his uh, Seneschal Caradoc to murder, that he was evil because of his father's deeds. And then his son is going to even trump his evil because he's got to make up for all the evil that Lord Soth did in his life, which is an insurmountable task. I dare anyone try. But the thought alone prevents him from grabbing his son. Um, oh, see, I keep, I keep losing myself in this story. It's so good. Um, he's convinced his son, so he turns his back, letting them die. With, his, uh, with her last breath, Isolde curses Soth, saying in part, you will die this night in fire, even as your son and I die. You will live one life for every life your folly has brought to an end. And she continued cursing him, but the fire and his own inner turmoil deafened him to uh, what she had to say. Soth is unaffected by the flames entirely. He's sort of just like suffering from PTSD in wartime. Uh, he just sort of staggers around his keep, stumbling into his throne room as fire and rage and people are dying all around him. He sees his throne and he goes and sits on this throne. And when he does, that's when the flames finally consume him. And he dies this horrible death. Uh, again, I'm jumping ahead here. Then he sees the elf maidens return as banshees, repeating his story through haunted song nightly. His 13 knights return as undead to patron uh, Dergard for all of eternity. I did not want this novel to end. It was so incredibly good. It gave us context to Soth's perspective in his mind through his character arc from famed Knight of Salamnia to doomed Knight of the Black Rose. I highly recommend this novel to anyone who loves the tragedy um, and Dragonlance in and of itself. This is a fantastic novel. So, now the tale of Lord Soth the details of it shift and they depend. I would call this the definitive tale because it's in novel form. Uh, you know, early on in the modules, uh, Lord Soth's story was provided. It was slightly different. You know, the, the main details are always there, but there's just little notes that differ in inconsistencies throughout. But ultimately, it's hinted in all of the tales that his wife's mysterious disappearance, but ultimately it was him that brutally murdered her. I thought adding that fact uh, added to the, the, the wretchedness and the evil nature that is inherent within Soth that, that he is capable of. And it's not because he's like an evil human being, right? He's doing it because he is tainted by evil emotions, right? He it fears, insecurities, jealousies, these are the emotions that drive him to commit these atrocities. And ultimately, they're the same emotions that drive the king priest and, in her time, Chrysania to do what she did and he did. I mean, th the fact is that Dragonlance is this narrative of good over evil, and it's talking about how these emotions can lead to evil acts in the guise of doing what is right to the individual in the moment, but having that sort of bird's eye view, being able to pull back and see the greater story, we can clearly determine that he was a messed up person. And arguably most of the Knights of Salamni that we're presented with are pretty messed up in almost every single story. Derek Crownguard. Um, so it's a running theme, you know, the 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 higher or the 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 higher you fly on your own airs, the farther you're gonna fall and get hurt by it. Uh, and ultimately, that's the tragedy, right? That's the turn of Lord Soth. Lord Soth's story, interestingly, I just started reading Night of the Black Rose, the second in this sort of Lord Soth trilogy that I'm sort of putting together uh, to provide you guys as reviews. 
it starts in Palanthus uh, in the Legends trilogy, right? When he is storming Palanthus on behalf of Kidiara of Matar, and um, he is reflecting on how he is murdering all of those people who had, you know, when he was getting ready to be murdered himself, being dragged through the streets of Planthus, and they were throwing rotten fruit and stuff at him. Uh, he vowed his revenge, and he finally gets it in Legends. So it's really nice to have this very beginning of the story of Lord Soth. You get to see his humiliation, and then you get to see his redemption in the very next book, Night of the Black Rose. And he's a bad guy, so you don't really want to cheer for him. But he's awesome, so you kind of cheer for him. You know, his deeds aren't great. They're horrifying. But I'm someone who loves horror movies, and I cheer for Freddy Krueger, and I cheer for Jason and Michael Myers. It's just what I do. So uh, I was cheering for Lord Soth here. I was really happy that he got the vengeance on those people that he was seeking. A little bit of redemption there. But anyway, um, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this review. If you enjoy these let me know um, in the comments and whatever. I, I really appreciate your time and attention if you're tuning in live or watching it after the fact. And again, give me a heads up whether you like these live videos or whether you would just prefer to see the artwork flashing before you as I review the actual story itself. Um, that is it for my review of Lord Soth by Edo Van Belkum. Uh, have you read the novel? What did you think of the fall of the infamous Lord Soth? And again, do you appreciate... Uh, hey, Richard, thanks for joining live, man. Um, you're at the very end though, <laughs> sad to say. Um, do you appreciate these reviews? If you do, you can always shoot me an email at info at dragonlance-saga.com or just leave a comment in the video itself. I'd like to once again invite you to consider becoming a patron or member of this channel and you can pick up Dragonlance Gaming Materials using my affiliate link, all of which are in the description below. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga and I hope you join me in the celebration. My name is Adam from Dragonlance Saga and until next time, Slanjavar.